Hello, 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 and welcome, welcome to today's installment of Created for More, the podcast. As usual, I have a great guest, and um, I can't wait to introduce her to you. I'll keep you waiting a little bit, but I will read her bio, and then let's see if you can figure it out. <laughs> so I've got an award-winning, multidisciplinary, and versatile infrastructure and energy executive and one of Africa's leading female voices on energy. Well, her name is Rolake and she has more than 15 years track record of helping to finance and scale businesses across Africa. She's currently the chief commercial officer of a leading infrastructure developer, Mixter Africa. And today, myself and Rolake are going to be having a great conversation on how she became so awesome. <laughs> So welcome my guest today. Her name is Rolake Akikumbe Filani. Welcome. Thank you so Hi. much. Hi. Hi. It's so great to be here. Your energy is infectious and I'm already feeling all the vibes, positive vibes. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm especially giddy today because I, I was saying just before we came on the show how much I've just admired you and I've just been like, oh my God, I'd love to have a conversation with her. So this is a dream come true. Just being here, um, sat across digitally from you uh, and I can't wait to get into today's conversation. So I've read literally a snippet of the script of your bio but i want you to humanize it for us i want you to tell us who you are in your own words you know who are you who is well like what is the essence of you go on <laughs> oh wow how do i talk about that well um maybe i can start with my name okay so i know we talked about this a bit but my name rolake is a shorter form of a fuller name morolake and I guess from the perspective of my parents, uh, it means that I have seen someone to treasure, or I have seen honor or wealth or riches to treasure. Mm. And another way to say this, I have seen something of worth to pamper or keep oh, because that. it's so precious. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a value and sentiment that has been instilled in me from a very, very young age. And I think when I look back on one of the really defining moments of my life, it's something that my dad said to me, I think I was about 12. Mm -hmm. And in one publication I, I wrote in sometime last year, I'd mentioned that that was the light bulb moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Because those words of affirmation and my validation that came from my dad made me believe I could take on the world. They were really affirming and validating. And it's something that has stayed with me from a very young age to now. And so when I think about my name, when I think about what God has put in me, what I am, I think this has to be nurtured. It has mm, to be developed. It. it has to be pampered. It has to be sustainable. It has mm. to stand the test of time. And mm. that is an ethos that has accompanied me in everything I do. So when you ask for me to personalize the introduction, that is really what I will boil it down to. I am something of worth by God's grace that the world is waiting to receive. So in everything I do, the multiple expression of my gifts, my talents, I will showcase it in a way that proves my worth and mm. validates those words that my dad spoke to me many many years ago that is who rolake is and this is what drives me but, yeah but i absolutely. think in in terms of just the the more practical aspects of what i do and who i am i i have a nine to five i'm a corporate executive i work in the infrastructure business but i also have uh several platforms through which i express my gifts i'm a public speaking coach i run a a business called i articulate where i focus on training executives with a focus on women but executives in general in the art of public speaking and effective communication i also do a lot of mentoring focused on career development and i use my personal platforms and social media on linkedin to do that um but i also enjoy working in the nonprofit space in the gender space with women with children i'm a passionate servant in the house of god so i serve I in ministry because i have a background as a musician 
and as a pianist, um, I've been using my musical gift for many years in the in the religious context. Um, so I currently serve in my local church as head of department for the music team. Um, and I'm very much really about new experiences, new horizons, just showcasing excellence and passion. I think one thing that people say when they meet me is that I have a great deal of passion. So if I'm pouring my heart into something, I'm going all the way 100% all the way, and okay. more. That is, that is a snippet of who Rolake <laughs> is. My kind of person. I love it. You see, what I love the most is when you say, you know, my, you know, your dad affirmed you as a child and, you know, and it's helped you. And I think the way you put it is you've got something of worth within you that you've got to showcase to the, you know, to the world. So what I would love to, you know, just talk about, touch on is it's just you know, your childhood, how you got to be. I want to just kind of see the evolution of roller care. Like, I've always known that it always starts in childhood. Um, and what I would like to get out of this is, you know, peradventure some people are listening and they're like, well, you know what? I, I never had that as a child and they've had to almost kind of repair it themselves. Um, one thing that we can all do, and I like how Maya Angelou puts it, is when you know better, you do better. So, you know, perhaps as we start to speak, people can take learnings that if not, you know, if it wasn't something that was done for you, you can I, you can do it for you know someone else, the next generation, your, ch your children and whatnot. But I would love to chronicle your story. like. You know, when did you start feeling special? Like when, when did when did your dad start to fill you with these ideas that you were superwoman? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, look, it, there's so much to say, but I just before I start telling that story, you know, when you were referring to those who maybe felt they didn't have that opportunity in childhood and are now wanting to work on oh. themselves, there's a there's a proverb, and I'm not sure what language is translated from, and it says that when you wake up is your morning. Love it. That's a literal. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, well. it, and it is the fact that today if you come to that realization of who you are and yourself then it starts today so you may not have had the opportunity to build whatever it is you're trying to build in the last 20 years but when you come to that realization that you have to do something then start today but mm -hmm. i think going back to my childhood the one thing that i do remember very clearly which grounded me was the simplicity of my childhood and my experience as a child i think i came from a fairly stable family environment which is great and i know not everyone has that mm -hmm. my parents weren't poor but they also weren't super wealthy but the one thing that i remember is just the simplicity of my existence so i wasn't unduly exposed to things before their time, so yeah, it's their time. So as a child i played as a child I had boundaries, I had limitations. But one thing that was very clear and was a constant, not just for me and my siblings, and I have three other siblings, I'm number two or four, the first girl, is that we were really encouraged to explore the full expression of who we were. Mm. So if somebody was really good in sports or athletics, yes, do your sports or athletics. It's not just about academia. If you're really good in music, and you wanted to do piano, do it. Now, if you felt you didn't want to do piano, fine, stop it. And that is something that I will always really thank my parents for because it meant that growing up, I was never afraid to try things. There was nothing I felt that if I don't spend just a few weeks or a few months learning and come up to speed, there's nothing I can't do. It doesn't mean I'm superwoman, but it ingrained in me a deep-seated belief and personal conviction about what I could do if I put my mm. mind to it. And I know mm. that sounds very cliche, but that is the reality. reality. And so if you grow up in that environment where it's kind of like, oh, you want to do? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, like you actually just grow up becoming that thing. You believe it. And mm. I remember this yeah, particular episode, you know, Tambra, I was watching, those were in the days when CNN had just come out and I come back from school and I would watch sort of CNN with my mom because she was so obsessed with CNN. She watched Larry King. She watched it. Oh, parents. Yeah. I, like, I, didn't, I didn't get it. It was just a fiction in my house. It. Like, there's always CNN on. 
<laughs> Always well. CNN. For her, it was CNN or tennis. Yeah, I remember this one particular day we had we had been watching CNN and my dad came into the living room and Christian Amampo was on. For those who know Chris, who don't know Christian Amampo is one of the most celebrated CNN anchors mm -hmm. and international journalists. Just really a fantastic woman. And he looked at the TV and he looked at me and said, well, okay, you know, you could become the Nigerian Christian Amampo one day. Oh, wow. How old were you? I probably was about 11, 12, you know, this was what I said, the affirmation. And what I didn't realize that did for me, I kind of looked at, I looked at my dad, this man who I look up to, my own father. And then I look at the screen, Christian, I'm, I'm poor. I'm like, yeah, girl. <laughs> but it unlocked something in my head mm. because Christiana Mampo was this woman I looked up to I saw her on the global stage she was just owning her space she was interviewing all these big you know world famous leaders and politicians and statesmen and women and she was on international TV and here was why a small young girl growing up in Lagos in Nigeria in Sub-Saharan Africa and the man the first the love of my life is love telling me life. that you could be that in fact it's not that you could be that i see you as that and i always share this story because the environment your your nurturing is so key to who you become mm -hmm. right and people often talk about how they're just born into circumstances and that's their destiny but no because my parents may not have affirmed me. They could have been so busy just trying to survive and get on with life. But those were words spoken mm -hmm. to a young person. And for me, it set up a chain of events and self-belief that has really laid the foundation for a lot of the things that I do today that I am, which is why today, anything I'm doing, I'm putting out there. It is all about empowering and affirming and helping people see themselves or mm -hmm. see their situations in a different light. It started a long time ago. And so for me, everything I touch, I want to touch it into that affirmation gold. You know, I want people to see themselves as something precious and worth showing to the world. And that is something that has always driven me in terms of purpose. That is something that has always driven me in terms of just wanting to affirm and build up those around me. So everything I put out there on social media, expressing who I am, supporting and inspiring people has always been about getting people to see themselves as gold, as these, mm. as these treasures that need to be developed and nurtured. And mm. then when they've been developed, nurtured and refined and showcased to the world, that mm. is essentially what has driven me. I love it. I love it. I love it. So today you are, you are not Christian, um, Christiana Amampo. You are, you're even better. You are the original. <laughs> Well, okay, there's no point being her, right? So you are, you know, when I when I look and um, I, when I observe you, right, and I see just how how much you're blazing a trail, right? Yeah. You are whether it's in the boardroom, and I love that you you know almost you you categorize you know the different things that, that that you've just spoken about in probably like that's just a snippet, right? the different, you know, branches or tranches of things that you're involved with, you know, from the boardroom, the stuff that you're doing there to public speaking, to mentoring, to your, you know, NGOs and all the things that you are doing. How did you go from, you know, the person who took that word, that self-belief from her dad? Mm. And, you know, what, what would you say were some of your key defining moments that led you to who you are now? Okay, yeah, really great question. So let me try and break it down. The first thing that I think I did very early on is the realization that I needed to become a lifelong learner. Mm. So if you've developed that spirit of curiosity, you realize that every stage you are in life, there is a competency gap. You don't know everything. So you position yourself as a lifelong learner. And the mentality of somebody who positions themselves as a lifelong learner is this. If I find myself in a situation, I get excited because I know there is knowledge to be absorbed 
there's wisdom to be learned there's a new horizon or just something new to discover so i'm constantly like an open book because i mm. want to learn i want to absorb and mm -hmm. you know the the great thing about learning is that learning unleashes things in you that have been lying fallow so mm -hmm. you didn't even know you had it so for instance let's say i knew that i would i could talk like as a child i used to debate a lot i'll argue <laughs> I could talk. So I know that I have that gift latently in me, right? But I needed to be willing to expose myself to an environment where I could learn more about how mm -hmm. to be a fantastic communicator, where I could read more, where I could watch others who were doing it and doing well. I had to open my mind and myself and I had to have a teachable attitude and spirit. Mm -hmm. Lifelong learning is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. I say that whether you're young or old, 80 or 20, if you stop learning, you're old. Yes, you're stop. old. <laughs> so that, that was something that stood, I think, stood me in, in good stead, uh, practically. The, the second point I would say is being willing to explore and embrace opportunities outside of your comfort zone. And mm -hmm. I know this is a tough one for people because some people grow up as young professionals. You know, I want to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor. Yes, you want to become a doctor. Or yes, you want to be a lawyer or you want to be a musician, whatever, a sports person. But the opportunity you get immediately may not be the one that obviously leads you down that yeah, road. Obviously leads you, yeah. Yeah, and, and this yeah. is an important point, yeah, mm -hmm. because sometimes we want the realization of our dreams and the fulfillment of it to happen overnight. Mm. And maybe if for some people it could, but if I had shot myself to the fact that, you know what, I'm just focused, I want to become Christian Amanpour, this global media person, I may have missed other opportunities that were knocking under my nose. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, the really funny thing is, just on the Christian Amanpour, and this is a practical example. When I came out of university, I studied politics and economics at university, and I wanted to literally save the world, world working in international affairs. And the medium I wanted to do that is, I wanted to become a TV journalist. A lot oh, of people wow. don't actually know this, but that was oh, my, wow. my very first graduate job I applied for was to Reuters to become a journalist and a reporter. And I didn't get it. It, it really, I felt really shattered, but let's leave <laughs> that in the past. And it was part of that Christian Amanpour planting that my dad had put in mm. me. So he really mm. had fed something in me and I believed I could do it. But for whatever reason, I didn't get it. I, I was really disappointed. It put me off and I said, you know what? I'll just work in international development. I'll just embrace the opportunities that I did get. And the funny thing is that all the opportunities that I've embraced in different sectors, I have always done quite a lot of media work. So I ended up getting in front of the screen anyway, even oh. though I didn't start building my career as a screen person. Oh, and I love this that. Is, this is a great lesson. Uh, and especially young people listening who are still trying to chart their course in life. It may not materialize overnight. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's the process that is really the important thing because there you're learning, there's pruning, you're building, you're learning from failures, successes, you're learning from other people. So for me, practically, that was one thing. And then you have to apply yourself. Apply yourself means you just have to literally do the work. So if you want to work in this space, what trainings, what courses, what does that trajectory look like? What is your plan for mm. doing that or for getting there? Mm. And finally, the, the final thing I want, I want to say about this is that you have to find ways to stand out. And because I do a lot of career mentoring now and things that I learned that worked for me. I mean, in fact, one of the posts that I, I did recently, I talked about tips for early year professionals, early career mm -hmm. professionals. One of the things that I did that was really, really excellent was to learn French, right? I learned French language from a very young age. About 60% of the jobs I've had so far required French as a language. And it opened additional doors. It helped me stand out because we live in a competitive world. The future of work is changing. So what are you doing over, above and beyond? And I think if you look at the little phases of my life, for each phase I had in whatever industry, there was something that I was trying to do that was different. And I made sure I always stood out. I and mean, it wasn't about me for a long time. I've always said that I felt a strong burden of representation. And, and so those are sort of four things that I think people can immediately start to practically apply to their journeys. So good. Lifelong learner. 
Um, I absolutely love that because if you're not learning, you're not you're not growing. Um, don't don't think that every opportunity will be you know an obvious signpost to where you want to go. I like that as well. I like apply yourself. Um, um, and then try and stand and make sure that you're standing out. I want to talk a little bit about applying yourself because I think that is so key. Um, I find that um, these days it just kind of feels like, you know, everyone is just content with being just doing the average. You learn and you go to school, you learn and that is it. Um, I want you to really, really, and if you can contextualize it, maybe with an example, and I like how you've talked about French, you know, what, what are some ways that you have literally gone over and beyond to, you know, to ensure that you get an understanding and, a, you know, a full grounding in some of the things that have mattered in terms of your life and career? Okay, I'll, I'll give two examples, but perhaps examples that people may not be expecting me to give. So um, many people may not know that I'm also a pianist. Um, oh. So I started playing piano from a young age. Again, one of the experiences that my parents exposed me to, which I'm really grateful for. How so old were you when you started? I was about five. I was about oh, wow. five. In fact, myself and my older brother started around the same time, but he, he wasn't interested after a while and he stopped. And... So I've always been passionate about the piano, but I knew that I wasn't necessarily interested in doing music as a full-time thing. It was always going to be a, a, hobby, uh, a, a hobby that was like, I was really passionate about, but I wanted to do it well enough to be able to do it on a bigger stage or at a higher mm -hmm. level. Uh -huh. So I remember when I was in university, so I trained as a classical pianist. I was playing Mozart, Schumann, and I'd done all the way to grade eight. When I got to the UK, I did the graded exams. I got the diplomas uh -huh. and all of that. And I remember when I got to London and I started university, of course, I had academics and all that, but music was still a passion. So I would go to the Shaw Library, my university at, the, at that time, and I would book uh, the piano rehearsal room because I didn't have a piano in my dormitory. And I would practice hours and hours on end. And then I remember there were afternoons and evenings where I would walk from my university campus all the way to this place called the Royal Festival Hall in London. Mm -hmm. I did that consistently for about a year, about once or twice a month. I would go and sit, in, sit down and listen to jazz music, live jazz music being played and study the pianists and what they were doing on the piano. And... I did that consistently for a year in my first year and a part of my second year in university. A lot of people don't know this. I'm gobsmacked. You can see my mouth. Like, for those of you who can't see video yeah. on the podcast, so, but I'm literally And I remember it was, those were the days when the bus fare in London was like 50 pence or one pound. And I, there were some days I was so broke. I would literally, instead of getting on the bus, I would walk all the way from King's Cross to Waterloo, the South Bank. For those who are familiar, Mm -hmm. that Russell Square Kings was and mm -hmm. I would walk all the way to the South Bank to listen to this concert and then the second year I then enrolled in a summer jazz class and what I realized it's a very simple formula Tombra within about 18 months of doing that I was able to start playing jazz standards consistently at a decent level i even have a small recording that we did in the studio in camden i remember wow. and it's really funny that i started as a classical pianist i was able to transition to start playing by air playing jazz music because from a young age i discovered that i could play by air mm -hmm. and i did it well enough to be playing in bands but i was not a full-time musician i was that in is uni that is what I want to unpick because and I'm like, what well, was driving you? A good question. So I now think, okay, what is it was driving me? And the thing that I realize there, let me let me be honest with you, I'm a bit of OCD, and if I'm passionate about something, right, there can be an earthquake going on, and I'll find time <laughs> to do that thing. So there has to be an innate drive in you, honestly. Otherwise, you won't get it done. There has to be an innate drive and desire. It's like something you can't live without. I loved music so much, even till today. 
people will be surprised to hear i love music a lot and i did it so well that even when i moved back to nigeria people sometimes would get confused because i did a couple of concerts and they were like are you a musician are you a banker you know and and so but i was able to develop my skill level excellently but it was through the consistent hours of just doing things that were over and beyond even if it meant there were some personal sacrifices involved and so now when i think back to those days i will walk and walk and walk and god knows i walked a lot in london i walked a whole lot i even have stories of when i would work from russell square to kennington in south london what? and because i was in i used to play in the music team at my church in kennington and there were sometimes because obviously my parents were paying international school fees there was only so much more pocket money they could give me they could give. and yeah so there were times i struggled i would literally raise the mattress of the bed to see if i could find 5p here and then when i didn't have and i was still waiting for my next pocket money to come from i would actually walk all the way to kennington just so i could attend rehearsals to play in the band a lot of the people, even the leaders in the church, did not know I used to do that then. Mm. But the reason I'm saying so is people see the product now. And mm. that's just one example. That's not even about the things that I did in my professional space. The second example is developing my expertise in the energy sector. And, you know, I've never worked in an oil and gas company. I've never worked in a power company. I've worked mostly in professional services. But once I recognized that I had a flair for something, and once people start giving me feedback that, well, okay, you know, you're really good at this thing. It sets up a trigger in my head. I shouldn't just take that information and pack it. Let me look at it and what I can do with it. How can I develop it more? And it's mm. literally just the intentional and deliberate action of saying, so I started to read. I, I bought a lot of books on the energy sector. Any opportunities that someone would call to invite, come and speak on this concerning energy, I would plunge at it because it was a learning platform and learning environment. And consistently, I build my expertise. And one of the highlights for me was 2015, when I received an award in Houston, there's this organization called Energy Corporate Africa for the best oil and gas analyst in Africa and the most valuable oil and gas female on the oil patch, 2015 Energy and Corporate Africa. And for me, that validated years of the work that I'd been doing in the sector. So I, I literally built this profile as an energy sector guru and as, as, as an energy sector person. And there's no magic in it. If you think about it, Tombra, there's no magic mm -hmm. in it actually. Um, I know I hear stories of people who suddenly get endued, endued with special gifts or grace and they wake up one night and they find that they're playing jazz music like, wow, no, there mm. is deliberate, consistent action, sometimes at a personal cost, sometimes mm -hmm. you're giving up something, whether it's time or relationships even but you're working at something consistently over time. And the reason you're able to do that is also because you've developed the ethos of being a lifelong learner. Mm. It just goes, and so let me give you another modern day example. So yes, I built my energy sector expertise, but guess what? I started as an oil and gas specialist and then I transitioned to renewable energy and started to look at energy transition because I was recognizing where the market was heading. And I know that if I just stayed focused in hydrocarbons or fossil fuels only, if the world was changing, my skill set would become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And now, beyond that, I'm now looking at carbon. How can I learn more about hydrogen? These are the new trends in the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what I say about being a lifelong learner. That is how mm -hmm. it works. Oh my gosh, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh my gosh, you epitomize every single thing we stand for on this show. The fact that you recognize that every single thing, and it goes back to what you said at the start, which is you realize that there's something of worth on the inside of you, which needs to be harnessed. It needs to be showcased for the world to see. So for you, that something of worth is actually multiple things. And as soon as Absolutely. you get an inkling, as soon as you you get a little bit of a window, sometimes somebody just gives you a little bit of a glimmer. Ah, this thing, oh, you are a bit good. Ah, you jump on it. <laughs> Guys, you've heard it. This is the secret to success. There's nothing else to say on this show. We are done. 
<laughs> this is the secret to success because what you're saying is that you didn't just wake up and find yourself in the board you didn't just stumble and you know find yourself doing the things that you're doing every single thing is underpinned by hard work Absolutely. hard work dedication desire to improve your self i absolutely love it i want to talk about communication because i believe that um that's also a part of you that you know why why did you get into that you know why do you feel that you know it is it is so important obviously i i know but i would love for you i would love to hear it in your own words yeah this this is really interesting the way life works i i you know it's it's all actually tied into everything i said because when you open yourself to a new opportunity or something that you've determined you want to go for, you suddenly discover another side to you that you didn't realize mm -hmm. you had. So it was in trying to build my energy sector expertise that I discovered, ah, okay, you're not a bad communicator, actually. And then people start commenting. So you're already putting yourself in an environment where you get feedback and mm -hmm. people respond to you. And you, you have to learn to recognize signs. So once I discovered that because I wanted to work in an industry that was so global, energy, oil, you know, it's something that is very global. Everybody's talking about, you know, you need to be in spaces on global platforms where they're talking and discussing the issues and trying to drive change in the sector. And the vehicle you need to be relevant, apart from the knowledge, is actually the vehicle that allows you to convey your ideas, mm -hmm. which is your ability to communicate. So it was like complimentary. Okay, now you want to become an energy expert. How will people know what you know if you're not telling them? And how mm -hmm. do you tell them? Are you in a position to tell them? How do you build capacity to tell them? And that is when I signed up. I will never forget for this course called Compelled to Communicate in London. And it was actually my best friend, Gloria, who is in America, that encouraged me because it was a friend of her that was running this course. And I, we used to go to this pub in Greenwich where we would have this class and they would give us all sorts of exercises. And guess what? I excelled. I excelled and I went back week after week and I would tell stories, develop myself. Then I signed up for Toastmasters in London. I wanted to take it to another level. And then I started to discover a, a mentoring side of me that I like to help people. And so people don't realize that before I moved back to Nigeria, I'd actually really started coaching people in communication because I realized that I got a kick and I got a drive from helping others. So now it wasn't just about Rolake wants to be speaking on the global stage. It was like, how can I help others unlock this magic in their own lives as well? Mm -hmm. That was how the idea of coaching in communication and public speaking. And of course, if you're coaching in communication and public speaking, you're speaking as well to coach yeah. other people so yeah. it was a natural fit and and that was really how it started and of course you get comments i found that the more i developed myself you know the more i would get opportunities the more i would get opportunities the more people would invite me back and it just it just becomes this vir virtual cycle and and really that was how the communication thing came in and of course if you're business minded you want to think about ways to monetize your gifts you know, you, you want to think about ways to make them relevant. And when I took a, a career break in October 2019, shortly after I had my, my baby, who's now three, um, I decided I would set this up as a formal business here in Nigeria and look at building it as an additional stream of income. And great, great, great move for me at the height of COVID in a of very course. difficult year was when yeah. I launched I Articulate. And today I have like over 20 private students. I've done so much corporate training. It's not even my full-time job. Uh, but but again, I had to start from somewhere. And actually, initially I was doing free lessons. I wasn't charging anything. And of course, referrals come and the rest, as they say, is history. So communication, I'm really passionate about. But I'm also passionate about it because a lot of people struggle. And for people, it creates the barrier to them getting opportunities. And okay. I even tell people that I coach that your opportunity is waiting on the other side of your fear with regards to your speaking mm. ability. So I'm just so passionate about getting people to finally make that switch mentally that they can communicate well and then actually see them communicating well. So that's something that continues to drive my passion in that area till today. Oh gosh, what a star. <laughs> what a star. So someone's listening to this. 
someone's been a little bit cynical and I'm like, oh, she's just, that's just her. She's just intelligent. That's such a, you know, I don't have those gifts. I don't have those kind of talents. There's nothing special about me, you know? I mean, what would you say? Would you would you say this prince, these are principles that are transferable, like be, regardless, are, are these, can this be anybody? Or is this unique to certain people? Just being okay, so really multifaceted, so just being able to, to do things in, in different spheres yeah. and, and being able to impact and influence like that. But Tumbra, we're all multifaceted. It's there's it's it's not a, a rollake thing. Of course, Rolake will have her own unique expressions of those gifts. But there is no single human being on earth that is not multifaceted. The problem is not everybody has unleashed the multiple expressions of who they are. And so today, me and you just here on this call could even be sitting on other gifts that we, we don't even know oh. that we, we have. So oh. it's it's not a Rolake thing. And it's really about you recognizing, you know, there's recognizing the low hanging fruit first honing the low hanging fruit and what do i mean by the low hanging fruit what are those things that fundamentally you do well somebody taps you you're sleeping they can just wake you up you jump out of bed you're doing it you're happy to do it even start from there don't let's even get complicated and say you want to start reading academic journals or, or whatever start from the simple basic stuff within your immediate environment because that is usually where we can make the greatest change so that's the first thing second thing and i always say this mentoring does help it is not the be all and end all but we all need relationships and for everything that i've told you the reality is people are a big part of this picture it's just that we haven't had time to delve in even just my dad speaking into my life that could have been anybody it could have been my uncle it could have been my friends it could have been a counselor at school <laughs> Building those relationships is absolutely key to your journey. I am not a self-made person. Nobody is a self-made person. Anybody who tells you they're self-made is on a slippery slope. That mm -hmm. is it. None of us is. And part of that could be just somebody who has made a sacrifice or invested something in your life or time or money or, or wisdom or books. They shared something with you that has triggered something in you. That is relationship, that is people. So that is absolutely key. And then thirdly about applying yourself, do the work, write down your plans, make them time bound. Where are you today and where do you want to get to tomorrow? And don't be afraid to fail. Honestly, mm -hmm. I was telling my fitness trainer earlier today that I, I apply for so many fellowships, right? Yeah. Um, no, honestly, this story is actually really funny, but that's another podcast episode. And I applied for so many fellowships. In fact, the number of rejections I got, and I remember one particular fellowship but that this I This is the thing. For, no that, one's going to see the rejections, but the nobody's day... Nobody's going to see the rejection, yeah. <laughs> and it was so bad. <laughs> this is part of my story that I do even share regularly. It was so bad one time that one fellowship that I applied for several times it was the same people on the admissions team. And one of them, who was a regional representative in Africa, called me and said, well, I can't have back. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what's going on? Please. And, you know, I remember he would laugh and joke, third time lucky, fourth time lucky. Anyway, Sha, let's, let's pack that. But the, but the point I'm making is that you will fail in quote. Um, you may not hit your goals all of the time, but it's fine. And the mm. reasons why you need to you need to not put yourself in a box. There's so many things you can do. And you know, the funny thing is life always leads you ultimately to what you deeply desire. And God has a way of leading you ultimately to deeply desire. It's just that some of us take different paths to get there. So some of the things I've been able to achieve, I may not be, have been able to achieve them through those fellowships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that if I'd got those fellowships, I also wouldn't have it achieved. I would have achieved something, maybe not in the same way. So it's, it's really about how you look at the picture as well, right? Oh, yeah. um, so everybody can be more. Everybody can fulfill and understand who they are, what they've been called to do and achieve their purpose. You just have to put your head down and do the work. There is no magic wand. There is no miracle to these things. The real miracle in it is achieving what you set out to do because you put the hard work. 
you know they always say that opportunity and good luck are two sides of the same coin you know it's hard work and luck they meet each other because you've done the work and then opportunity comes love it 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 in my um and i'm torn i'm torn that this has to be if I'm, I'm torn i'm even saying final because i i could talk to you like <laughs> you're just so you, you you just have such a wealth of wisdom that i i want to just keep um picking um i want to talk to you about you know what you've just talked about failure because mm. so many people get stuck on that how did you get so comfortable with failure i mean what you were just saying like yeah you would apply for fellowship like i don't know that many people who would do it more than twice like they'll do the first time get rejection like the the brave super resilient they will do it the second time but you you don't typically find people who will go keep going what is that thing that that has helped you become so comfortable because it's really yeah. the people who are comfortable with failure that succeed and I want people okay. to get it. That's an interesting way. I actually don't think I'm comfortable with failure. Um, don't get me wrong, because you know, in fact, it's it's so funny you ask. There's something that I'm, I'm I want to do right now in this phase in my life, some new project that I'm working on, and there's a small part of me that's a bit afraid. Um, but it's not a crippling fear. Uh -huh because I've seen how things haven't worked out, but I've still been okay in the past. Uh -huh. But there's always a part of us that asks, what if, what if, what if, what if? Mm -hmm. So it's not a comfort with failure. It's a deep belief that I have the ability and the skill and the mindset it takes to turn things around eventually. Oh. So it's, so, and, and this is where the self-development comes in. So. If you fail at something, it's one thing to fail out at it. It's another thing to know how to pick yourself up again and move uh -huh. forward. Uh -huh. And that knowing how to pick yourself again, up again and moving forward is something that you have to nurture. Uh -huh. Because there are times in my life I failed. For instance, I failed at relationships and I thought I, I couldn't see the wood from the trees. And I thought I would never be able to move on. But I did because I had a certain grit that had developed over time in other circumstances which I could now bring to bear in this one that seemed like failure. And the, you know, the reason why you have to express yourself in multiple ways is the reality is it's also like a risk management strategy, right? If there is more to my life than just this one thing, if this one thing doesn't work out, I don't feel like I've lost myself or I've lost opportunities because guess what? I can nurture this other thing, spend time of, on it. And maybe because I've neglected it, which is why I think I've always said I've never been defined by my corporate roles mm. ever. My nine to five will never define me. That title can be CEO. It can be director. Rola Ken knows who fundamentally who she is and what god has instilled in her so if my company or my boss were to say today sorry your services are no longer required i'm okay mm. and it's not because i'm okay financially it's not even about the money because even if i didn't have the money i can make something of that situation somehow i've nurtured enough of my gifts to be like, you know what, maybe if I give myself two to three years, I can build this into something. Oh. And, and that is absolutely key. So which is why I tell a lot of people, build yourself over and above that thing that has come to define you in the eyes of other people, in the public eyes, because life is so fleeting. Things can change, times can change. The person who thinks is standing can fall. So I think for me, that seemingly embrace of failure is really just an ability to weather change oh. and your ability to weather change needs to have you need certain ingredients and skills you obviously need to be strategic you also have to have built relationships because guess what in those times that you think you feel there are people whose doors you have to knock on to say you know what I'm struggling can you help me or i need to try something new can you introduce me to this so there's several ingredients that go into your ability to weather those change or difficult seasons 
and you have to build and develop them over time so that you're not now in that season and you're struggling and you're going helter skelter and it's something that anchors you but there's also the faith aspect and of course we could talk about this again faith is such a central piece in, in my life especially when it comes to dealing with difficult seasons I, I have so many examples of ways in which my faith has carried me but you know faith and works go hand in hand oh. and works is about capacity and capacity is about tools and training and resources uh -huh, and uh -huh. things that you've you've built up over time uh -huh. that allow you to be prepared and and uh -huh. a lot of us need to build capacity uh, that's the reality because you know we need to get back up again after uh -huh. we've been down i love it i love it so what i hear you say is it's really understanding the process um, the mindset of, of building that helps you whether you know any disappointment or anything like that knowing that whatever happens and you hear of this when you hear stuff like oh a millionaire you know lost all of this money and then before you know it he's gone in and he's been able to build you know another successful venture again because those sort of people they understand the principles of building right yeah so wherever you yes. find yourself you can always build so it's understanding that you yes. can always build something out of yourself. I, I love that. And another thing which I, I find that I see, and I, I don't know how closely linked it is, but I think it's here somewhere. Um, it's a slightly nuanced um, view on failure. I find that a lot of people don't want to lose, right? Or don't want to, you know, fall out of the bucket, but they're not keen to win. Do you see what I mean? So you find a lot of people that just kind of happily Play come safe. in the middle tier and they, they would just happily stay as long as I'm not last. And, and, and we get so comfortable with, with phrases like, I will never carry last. You know, but no one is talking about, okay, what about carrying first? What about doing more? What about, you know, actually, you know, living, you know, life at your fullest potential? I find that a lot of people are just you know what would you say to that that that's an interesting one and and i i think it, it's really about who you surround yourself with um and this is a lesson that i've come to discover ha ah, who you surround yourself with the environment you put yourself with sometimes the difference between that thirst for more that's I want to be head and not tail thing has to do with who is in your circle mm. because you know iron sharpens iron mm. this is something I'm discovering in my life oh. <laughs> even at this stage mm -hmm. even at this stage I'm discovering it anew so I find that that desire to succeed to be driven can be influenced by other people what they're saying to you, how they're living their own lives, the level of proximity they have to you, how much they're influencing you. Mm -hmm. So that's key. But I also think part of the challenge is people are also afraid of what people will say. So, you know, I told you I'm working on a new initiative now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that voice was creeping in. Or ah, what would people say? That And the, the voices are so funny. Those mm -hmm. voices of doubt. Mm -hmm. It's either, oh, look at her, she's come again. Ooh, she's, mm -hmm. you know, she's always mm -hmm. overdue, overdue. There's that voice as well. And and that's a really odd voice, actually. But there's, there's also the voice of, you can't do it. You will never do it. It will never work. But mm -hmm. there's a voice of, actually, you're afraid to succeed. I don't know if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Because you don't want to, mm -hmm. you don't want mm -hmm. to, you don't want to stand out too much. You don't want to. Please, let me give you a mic. Let's, let's, let's drop. This is like several, multiple mic drop moments. Just let's just drop everything. It's, and it's, it's not, it's not arrogance, but it's one of those things that um, you, it's, it's really weird. And, but there's also a self-consciousness that comes with it. I, so I, I think, I think that the challenge is at some point the acceptance of who i am and who i've been called to be and the acceptance of who we are and who we've been called to be not being afraid to fail is just as bad as being afraid to succeed because being it will set you apart and you know human beings we're naturally we want to fit in you want to fit in with the pack so that fitting in can be a negative or positive type of fitting in 
Mm. I don't want to be the one who stands out because I'm self-conscious. And but that standing out can actually be a positive thing. Mm. So I think a lot of it is mindset. And the reason it's funny that now I'm talking about it philosophically, but the roots of this voice was that story I told, I think you said you heard it, that where in school I always felt conscious because I was tall. Mm. And so I always stood out physically first. Mm. <laughs> I always felt awkward. My legs were funny. I was lanky. I was this. And sometimes when I look at pictures of myself, it sort of takes me back to that time. I just have to beat myself back and say, well, okay, no, 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 just, just behave. But there is a certain psychology that comes with that. So, but I've come to accept it. And sometimes it creates a self-check. Let me give you an example. So I've been in situations where I go to a meeting or I'm in a group where we're working on a project. And before you know it, someone will say, okay, Rolake, you lead. And I'm like, why me now? I said, I, you are naturally just lead. And so there are times when, because I don't want to be put in that position, I will deliberately just minimize my contributions. Mm. And it's a, it's wrong thinking. It is. There's, there's a place where you give space for other people, true. And you have to, as a leader, you have to be emotionally intelligent and give space to other people. But sometimes, you know, there's a reason why we're called salt and light. There is. After all, what is the point of this existence if we're not constantly shining mm -hmm. wherever we are? Mm -hmm. No matter it, somebody can call me to come and be the maybe working the people who collect rubbish on the streets. Mm -hmm. And in that place, I will thrive and I will stand out because that mm. is who God has called me to be, mm. right? And it may be due to other unique gifts and abilities which are not related to collecting rubbish. It may be because that I'm the one who can help other people speak up. Mm. But for whatever reason, I will stand out in that setting because I've been called to be salt and light. And so it's like, we have to go around recognizing that we have this invisible halo not that mm -hmm. you are big or yeah all that but that there's always a call on us in whatever space we are in we find to ourselves stand in, out. to stand out yeah so the fear of standing out which can be a positive thing is self-consciousness mm -hmm. that in itself can be crippling mm -hmm. and and so that is a mindset that we 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 have to master as we mature in understanding mm -hmm. of who we are and the fact that like your podcast we've been created for more so we are meant to stand out mm -hmm. right so, yeah. that is that is really what it is i think um what is so great is that you have literally given a master class in in one of the biggest issues um that that, that, that i know the multi-potentialites face just again another thing you know and and the and, and to whom, what's that? So there's, there's this, um, from, is it, there's a phrase, um, is it matter? No, not metaphor. No, no, it's fine. To whom, to whom much is given, much is expected. Much is expected, yes. So there's a reason that you can do more. Mm. There's a reason, right? So there's also an expectation that you do do more. If not, you haven't fulfilled those reasons. And, and then you're going to get, you know, you're going to get it on the last day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, cool. In my actual final, final question now, I want to talk about your daily habits because I, I know that at the end of the day, it comes down to what you do on a daily basis. You know, we can talk up, talk down, da, 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 but the people don't really, you know, change at a really, really micro granular level. The, you know, you're the sum total of the daily decisions that you make. So what, what does a, a day for you look like? What are your, what are some daily practices that you feel are, are um, have sustained you and, and helped to contribute to the success that you've achieved in your life? Okay, the first obvious daily gratitude practice is just being grateful. Um, because, you know, without life, all of these things that we're talking about, in fact, you know, there's, there's no point. You know, it would just be a poof. We wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be able to do all these things. We wouldn't be able to express ourselves. So gratitude is a daily practice in the place, place of prayer. My second daily practice is because i'm a professional but i'm also a wife and a mom 
I have now over the last year and a half made a specific and deliberate point of leaving the office at closing time every day and coming home to my family. Extremely important because that balancing perspective influences other areas. And what do I mean? So the, the consciousness and knowledge that I have responsibilities at home mm -hmm also actually helps me in whatever I do. It's an expression of who I am. It's one of the outlets through which, and it's one of my platforms, it's one of my domains through which I express myself. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely key. It keeps things in check. I, I can do some reflection. I can get feedback from my family, from my kids, from my husband. And so that balance between the professional and my work life and the deliberate and intentional decision to leave work on time so I can be at home is absolutely key. Mm. The second thing that I do on a regular basis, I wouldn't necessarily say I do it on a daily basis, is that I read a lot. I don't read mm. absolutely every day, but I read a lot, a whole lot, because there's a knowledge piece. So I'm either reading a book or I'm reading an article, and oh, it's wow. usually something in my domain or my area of expertise. Um, mm. It's very important. Recently, I pivoted over the last year and a half to the real estate sector, infrastructure development. So I'm Lovely. starting, I'm reading and reading around it. And that formula has worked for me when I was developing my expertise as an energy sector person. So mm -hmm. I know it works. I know it mm -hmm. works. I know the things I need to do. I know the types of articles I need to do. I need to read. I set up Google Alerts for industry data that come into my email inbox on a regular basis, including for my speaking engagements. So everything that looks excellent has an anchor behind it. And that anchor, obviously, like you said, it's a, it's a habit, it's a practice, um, it's a routine, it's a formula, and there is a formula and it has to be deliberate. So those are some of my daily habits and my daily practices. I don't know if they're all daily, to be honest. I'm not going to lie here and say I do them yeah. every day. But I do them <laughs> consistently enough for other people to recognize that this is a thing that Relaka does. Uh -huh. And I do them consistently enough for them to make a difference uh -huh. in, in, my, in my journey, really. Yeah, your key contributory factors for success. Ronica, I honestly couldn't love you more than I do now. I thought you were awesome before, but now, I literally, we've taken this thing out like to another stratosphere. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for pouring out with just so much goodness, weighty value. I know that people are going to be blessed. Guys, listen, in, listen to this over and over until you get the spirit of Rolake. Do not mm -hmm. stop listening. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's been such an oh, awesome time speaking with you. Such an honor and privilege. Thank you so much. I do not take it for granted because I've actually seen created for more around. I was like, oh, I would really love to be on that. <laughs> That's something I didn't tell you, but yeah. <laughs> I knew about you before you approached me to be oh on this. Gosh. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to engaging with you and your audience, hopefully sometime in the future. Awesome. We might just we might just get you back at some point. We'll be like, there's a part two here somewhere. There's a sequel. <laughs> I'm sure. But yeah, we look forward to seeing you, you know, with just many more great accomplishments in your new ventures, the ones you've started now, the ones that you're that you're still going to do. I know you're going to do so many, so many more great stuff. And uh, we're, we're here cheering your cheering you along. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Thank you.